Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the White House. My name is Joshua Dubois, and I'm executive director of the White House Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. And it is truly my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of President Obama to this event celebrating adoption and foster care and the individuals, families, parents, organizations, and government officials who are supporting adoption around the country and indeed around the globe. Uh, the president wanted me to personally welcome many of his good friends who are here today. He's actually at a summit um, on issues uh, across Europe today, but he wanted me to say hello. And he actually asked me to do something for those who are attending this event and, and that he, he knows. And you're just going to have to bear with me. I've been working for the president for a long time, and when he asks you to do something, you have to do it. So <laughs> if, if you wouldn't mind just raising your hands like this, please. In the back there, too, please. Thanks. <laughs> Could you move them like this, please? Okay, I promised President Obama I'd shake everyone's hand at the adoption event this morning. So I'm sorry, folks. That's horrible. <laughs> but I did my job. So, listen, I am so excited for the day that we will have together today. It's, it's a day, first and foremost, to celebrate National Adoption Month and the positive impact that adoption and foster care have played in the lives of countless Americans. We'll have an opportunity to hear from senior administration officials and government officials who care deeply about adoption and have advanced policies to support adoption. Today, we'll also provide an opportunity to hear and learn from one another. We have three tremendous panels, one on international adoption, one on infant adoption, and one on foster care, where we're really going to dig deeply into current best practices and opportunities for future innovations. It's our hope that you will leave here today inspired by a new thought or an idea and prepared to, uh, to forge a partnership with another organization represented here in the room today, or simply encouraged by the good work that's happening all around the country and indeed around the globe. Helping to lead us throughout the day is my good friend and assistant in the faith-based office, Michael Weir. Michael, if you wouldn't mind standing up for us. Let's give Michael a round of applause for his great work in pulling together today's event. Michael's gonna facilitate many of our panels along with Alexia Kelly, the deputy director of the faith-based office, who's in the back today. I also want to say a special word of welcome to everyone who's joining us on the live stream at whitehouse.gov slash live. Everyone wave to the live stream there. <laughs> Hi, folks. Um, and I would encourage you all, if you're um, connected to Twitter, to tweet throughout the day as well. Anyone on Twitter in the room? Please feel free to tweet about what's happening uh, throughout the day and sharing the, uh, share the information that we're going to learn with those around the country. We're going to get right into our program now. And at this time, I'm honored to introduce the head of the Environmental Protection Agency and the president's point person on the protection of, of our environment, Administrator Lisa Jackson. Administrator Jackson has, a, had a, has had a distinguished career fighting for families all around the country. She joined the EPA as a staff level scientist in 1987 and spent the majority of, of her career working in EPA uh, Region 2 in New York. In 2002, Administrator Jackson joined the New, Der New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection and was appointed commissioner of that agency in 2006. In 2009, Administrator Jackson was appointed as the head of the Envi Environmental Protection Agency. Administrator Jackson's career has been rooted in the health and welfare of children and families, and so it's no surprise that she's here with us today. As an adoptee herself, she is someone who understands the power of adoption in a young person's life. Let's welcome Administrator Jackson. Well, thank you, everyone, and good morning. I am humbled to be here, and um, I think this is a perfect example of preaching to the choir. So um, forgive me. They asked me to come and share my story, um, which I'm happy to do, um, but I'm sure it's one that many of you have either experienced or been a part of over many years. Now, this is a story that um, we've only recently started talking about in my family, um, and I'll explain why as we go along. But I feel comfortable that you can tweet or simulcast because my mother <laughs> hasn't quite caught up with technology. <laughs> so do whatever you like. Just don't write her a letter or call her um, and tell her I was talking about her. Um, but all to the good. Um, I, grew, I was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. But uh, anyone who's ever heard me speak knows I say I am a proud native of New Orleans, Louisiana. And the less than just about a month that I spent in Philadelphia is, um, is my adoption story, or really my parents' adoption story. Um, my mom and dad had been trying for a long time to have children, and that wasn't working out for them. Um, and as it turns out, 
my mom was working at a Catholic, uh, we are Catholic, we grew up in a, I grew up in a Catholic family. My mom was a secretary at a big Catholic high school in New Orleans, St. Augustine's. And she let it be known that my father and she were thinking they would try the adoption route. And I was born in 1962, just to give you a sense of the time period. And um, my parents are African American, and, um, but they are very fair skinned. Or, or somewhat fair skin like I am today. And I tell this whole thing just to show you how much adoption has changed, even in my mother's uh, own sort of uh, telling, as it turned out. So they decided that they wanted to adopt a child. They uh, didn't really know whether or not they wanted to adopt boy or girl. They didn't care. They wanted a healthy, happy baby. They uh, knew back in those days um, cross-race adoptions were extremely rare, and especially um, what they would have been doing if they crossed races. So they were going to have an African-American child, or back then we were colored, I think. Before, we might have been Negroes, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> um, and so they started looking, and they went all over the South. And as it turned out, interestingly enough, back then, apparently, one of the things people said was, we want a baby that looks like it might belong to you. So not only could they, were they looking for an African-American child, but they soon found out, and they were surprised by this, that they were looking for an African-American child who was fair, like they were. Um, and so that became a very, very difficult search for them. It wasn't one that they imposed on themselves, but one that the system, in fact, they always cite the nuns, we all know the nuns, you don't cross the nuns, would say, no, we'd love to give you a baby, but we're going to give you a baby who's going to fit into your family and who's not going to be the subject of a lot of questions. I always laugh because I think about my neighbors who have adopted Korean children and, and elsewhere. How much has changed in the almost 50, oh, well, 50 years almost since I was adopted? Um, thank God. Um, but so anyway, so their search ended up taking them far and wide. And before you know it, they were on a train because an orphanage in Philadelphia, I believe it was called St. Elizabeth, said they had a baby boy that they wanted to show them. And they went to the orphanage and they walked in to see my brother, Mark, who they also adopted, just get you the end of the story. Um, and um, we had different birth parents, but he was there. And apparently, this, the family lore goes that they walked in and the nun said to my mother, oh my god, you look just like the birth mother of another baby that we have, which is me. And apparently, so they went in expecting to co come home with a baby. and. They put me in my dad's arms, and I probably had gas, but I smiled at him, and apparently <laughs> that moment on, I was less than a month old, folks, um, they decided they were going to take two babies home, which, which they did. So my brother and I were both adopted in uh, 1962, and um, they brought us home, and as luck would have it, as it turns out, just to answer one other piece of the story, five years later, my mother got pregnant with my baby brother. John, so we are actually three siblings in the family. John just adopted his son, I say just, the child is in second grade now, I believe. Um, and he's much darker than, than everybody in our family, so things have changed, thank God. Um, and that hasn't been an issue. But I always say that, um, you know, it, it was a closed adoption, it remains so. People often ask me, well, have you looked for your birth mother? And while I'm incredibly grateful to her and sometimes hope that she has some way of knowing um, what she did by giving me the gift of life, first and foremost, and the unselfish gift, and I can't imagine what that must have been like. The family lore is that she was a college student, so she was a young woman. Um, my mother made that up because that made it so I had to be smart, I think. But, um, <laughs> You know, it, I never looked for her. Part of it was because of my mother, who I think would have felt very strongly, and maybe even today, that somehow that was saying that she was not enough. And so I'm a big supporter of opening adoption laws so that that decision isn't before a family or an adoptee. Um, the only time that I really felt a sense of maybe longing or loss was when I was pregnant with my own children. Um, not having any kind of family history at all. So I have had every screening test they make for every disease you could possibly pass on because no one was quite sure of my ethnicity. Um, uh, and so there was clearly an opportunity that I might be mixed, and so they tested me for everything. Um, and those, were the, those are the times when you wish you could give your children a stronger sense of both sides of their health history. 
Um, obviously, being a mother myself made a much more poignant moment when you realize how uh, difficult a decision that must have been for a young woman much younger than when I have my children. And so um, certainly I think about it often and of course the only thing I'd ever want to say is thank you. Um, the only other thing I want to address is um, telling uh, because my parents sat me down when I was little and I to this day remember the conversation um, where it was kind of awkward and weird but they were worried rightfully so, that enough of the community, we grew up in a pretty, grew up in the Ninth Ward in New Orleans, a very tight-knit community, and everyone knew that I was adopted, that some kid would tell me and make it into a stigma and sort of make me feel bad, like I didn't really belong. Uh, and so they didn't want me to hear it that way, so they sat me down and told me how special I was. And I do remember that conversation, and I remember to this day, walking away feeling what a special gift, because as my father said, you know, we didn't get stuck with you, we picked you out. Um, and that was a really, really special moment for me. Um, at the end of the day, I cannot thank each and every one of you enough for um, what you do um, and for um, the changes that you make in lives you'll never see. I am absolutely convinced that my brother's decision to adopt was as much about uh, knowing our history is about any decision uh, otherwise made. And I think um, that legacy of adoption in our families um, it will continue um, as we move forward. So again, thank you all for what you do. Have a wonderful day. And um, from, from one adoptee to all the folks in this room who work so hard on it, know, know that um, I'm most, most grateful. So thank you very much. Thank you, Administrator Jackson, one more time for sharing that powerful story with us. Thank you so much. We weren't stuck with you, we chose you. I love that. Uh, next, it is my pleasure to introduce Senator Amy Klobuchar. Uh, since her election to the United States Senate in 2006, Senator Klobuchar has been a strong advocate for Minnesota values on the critical issues facing our nation, from promoting long-term economic growth and job creation to bringing fiscal responsibility and accountability to Washington, from supporting Minnesota businesses, workers, and farmers, to developing homegrown energy. A former prosecutor for Minnesota's largest county, Senator Klobuchar has worked across party lines to pass legislation that represents the interests of the people of Minnesota, including providing full funding for the I-35 West Bridge, working with the Minnesota National Guard to support the Beyond the Yellow Ribbon program, and helping Minnesota families with everything from adoptions to consumer issues. Senator Klobuchar is a member of the Judiciary Committee, the Commerce Committee, the Agriculture Committee, and the Joint Economic Committee. Working Mother Magazine named Senator Klobuchar in 2008 as the best in Congress. The American Prospect named her a woman to watch. The Star Tribune has called her a fast-moving legislator, and the Washington Post has described her as a rising star. She's certainly a rising star in the area of adoption and was the chief sponsor of the International Adoption Simplification Act. Because of Senator Klobuchar's work, this law is helping families form and siblings stay together, and we're so honored to have her here today. Let's welcome Senator Klobuchar. Well, thank you so much, Joshua. And I was just so, what an amazing story that Administrator Jackson, I, I don't know about you, but I would rather use my time asking her questions, okay? <laughs> but you guys are stuck with me. Um, and I was thinking, how do you follow that amazingly personal story? But I did want to uh, acknowledge uh, Joshua and Administrator Jackson, uh, as well as Ambassador Jacobs, and a few friends of mine that are out there. Uh, Maureen Warren, uh, who's here from Children Home Society, where are you, from Minnesota? Um, and then also Jennifer Peria, who is the uh, director of the Children's Action Network in Los Angeles. So just two of the many people uh, that are working on these issues every single day. I wanted to bring regards from Senator Landrieu, who as you know also works on this. I was teasing her at an event at the State Department that you know when Mary wants to get something done in adoption, because this is how it starts. She's like, 
I know you're trying your hardest here. I, I know you are, but those kids are still stuck in Guatemala. I know you're doing everything you can. I'm sure Administrator Jackson knows exactly what I'm talking about in other contexts, but I think you know that Mary's been an ardent advocate and heads up the adoption uh, caucus in the United States Senate. So I got interested in this in a few ways. First, uh, when I was growing up in suburban Minnesota, as you can imagine, uh, there were not uh, there were a lot of adopted kids actually, but not a lot of kids that were of color in our school, not a lot of kids that were adopted from other countries. But when I was in sixth grade, a girl came to the class named Mickey Young Lee, and she was adopted from Korea, and I was assigned to teach her English. And I would go into this room with her every single day, and that was my first experience with a child that was adopted uh, from another country. And my interest grew from there. When I was a prosecutor uh, in Hennepin County, uh, which is Minnesota's largest county, I got very interested in the idea of permanent homes and making sure that kids uh, were not stuck in going back and forth to different places and saw um, what the effect that would have, not only on the prosecution we did, because uh, they would tend to get in trouble more, uh, but also on their lives and the lives of everyone in the community around them. So we really sped up the time uh, to get them into permanent homes. And then I got to the Senate, and that's when I realized that our state uh, was somewhat unique. We actually have the highest rate per capita for international adoptions uh, in the United States. Uh, part of that is just the background that we've had of working with other uh, countries and uh, we have uh, come a long way since we had a senator who was one of only two senators to vote against the UN Charter, but that's ancient history. Um, and so uh, we have really had a lot of kids come in from other places. And as a result of that, uh, when you're the senator from Minnesota, you get involved with a lot of these families firsthand. And at a time when government trust, as you know, is, is faltering somewhat, I have found it to be the most rewarding work that we've done, where you can actually help a family in need at that moment and make a difference. Uh, probably one of the most memorable ones was a woman named Betsy Sathers. Uh, she and her husband had been married for only 10 months. Uh, when he was driving over the 35W bridge uh, the day that it collapsed, and he died in that tragedy. Uh, and before they died, he died, they had had a discussion about adopting children, and they hadn't really, uh, really even gotten too into the process. But she decided after he died that she was going to adopt children on her own. So then Betsy decides to adopt children from Haiti. And so her children were ready to come over when the earthquake struck in January of 2010. Um, so to kind of complete the circle, we were able to help uh, and get those children out with the help of the State Department. And they are very happy kids, and I just saw them a week ago. Another story uh, that really brought me to the legislative front of working on this was the McCorris family from Cambridge, Minnesota. Uh, they were trying to adopt nine children from the Philippines. Okay, this is like a Philippine sound of music story, okay? <laughs> and so the, the mother had died suddenly, and the two older kids had insisted on keeping the nine of them together. And they ended up in an orphanage. And as the time went on for the adoption, as it was pending, the two older kids turned 16 and then 17. So as you know, under the rules the way they were, these kids were then permanently banned from being adopted. They were going to be permanent orphans. So the McCorses family came into our office uh, and talked to us about it with their picture. And once you see the picture of these nine kids, you're never the same, uh, including live video of them talking to you and everything. So we decided to take on this issue, and I led the bill um, to make it so that if you have, and we would have liked to make it for all kids up to 18, but it was what we could get, was if there's a younger sibling being adopted, if the older one turns 16, 17, they can still be adopted. So I enlisted in this effort. As you know, it can be a very hard culture in Washington right now on anything involving other countries or immigration. Uh, but I enlisted Senator Inhofe and Senator Sessions, uh, who I knew from the prayer breakfast, and Senator Sessions serves with me on the Judiciary Committee. Um, and we were able to get that bill done in a very difficult climate uh, at the end of last year. We had a few members that were problematic, and every time we did, I would literally send the book choruses out with their picture to their offices, <laughs> and they would wait in the lobby until someone would talk to them and show the picture. And inevitably, a staff member would then call our office and go, we saw the picture. We're, we won't stop the bill anymore. Um, so it was a total grassroots effort with the help of many faith-based organizations organizations and many adoption agencies uh, in our state and through the country. And um, it really was uh, to think that it went back to 08 and then to be there 
um, literally only a few months later um, when they brought those kids over and to see all those nine kids in 10 below zero Minnesota weather uh, was, worth, was worth everything we did to get it done. Uh, so I think there's still a lot of more work to be done uh, in that international adoption as well as domestic adoption. One bill I have is to look at post-adoption services. You all remember the issue when that child was sent back to Russia with a note pinned to him, um, some of these horrible things we've seen, and we really don't have good data. And a lot of it, I think, will shine brightly and well on adoptions to show the success we've had, where there are issues, so that we can work with these families to resolve them instead of having something happen like that. So uh, we've been working hard on that as well as other issues. We got the vaccination issue resolved where the vaccinations for international adoptions can occur in this country, but there's still a lot more work that has to be done. Uh, and as I said, I'm ready to do it. And I am pleased to say we also have a number of my Republican colleagues that are ready to do it. So given that it's the holiday season, I thought I would end with one story uh, about the work that all of you do uh, every single day. This actually happened when my daughter was four years old and she was in the church uh, nativity play and she was to play the angel. And we were sitting out in the pews and she had these huge angel wings on, like weighing her down, right? But she will not go up to practice. And we're sitting out there, I'm trying to be nice so she doesn't start to cry. I'm like, why won't you go up there, you know? The kids are all having fun. Some of you have been through this before. And she says, I want to be the donkey. <laughs> and I look, and I said, well, Timmy and Joey are the donkey. And these kids are really hot, these teenagers in this donkey outfit. And she says, well, then I want to be married. And I go, well, Mary is 16 years old. You can't be Mary. You're only four. And I said, I don't understand it. You have like the coolest part in the whole thing. You, you get to come out at the end, spread your wings. And she looks up way to the top of the church and she said, Mom, I can't tell them I don't know how to fly. <laughs> and I said to her, I said, you know what, honey? Not all angels fly. And I think you all know that because there are a lot of angels in this room right now and there's a lot of angels that you work with, whether they're parents, whether they're uh, people that have made difficult decisions about uh, giving up their children or whether they're parents that want those children and to bring them into a loving home. And you are their angels to give them the wings. So I just want to thank you for everything you've done and it's just an honor to be here today. Thank you very much. <laughs>